Hello, thank you for coming to my presentation. My name is Pete Marshall. I am the Communications Director with Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. We're a nonprofit that has been around for over 40 years working to protect, preserve, and restore the Boundary Waters area wilderness. Uh, currently, our primary work involves leading the fight against the two proposed copper sulfide mines in northeastern Minnesota, Twin Metals and Polymet. Uh, but a big part of our mission is also to promote the Boundary Waters and to ensure that people get up there, explore it, fall in love with it, and in turn work to protect it. And that's what I'm hoping to do with this presentation today. 25 tips for a better Boundary Waters experience. Now, these tips go beyond the basics such as put a rain fly over your tent when it rains or sleep on something cushiony because rocks are not easy to fall asleep on. Um, this, this really goes into some things I've learned over the years I've spent paddling through the Boundary Waters and up in northern Can Canada that I found to be particularly helpful both for the overall experience and for maybe day-to-day -day interactions with people I paddle with. Number one, work on your paddling stroke. This is really easy to neglect. One of the reasons is that you can kind of fake your way through a canoe trip. You can go on a five-day Boundary Waters trip, make 40 miles or so, and not really know how to paddle. Um, it does surprise me each time I'm out how many people paddle on the same size. So first and foremost, paddle on opposite sides. The person in the front, the person in the back should be paddling on opposite sides. Paddling on the same side is like slowing down when you merge onto the interstate. It's like kissing your sister. You just don't do it. So that's enough with my rant about paddling on both sides. It's pretty clear how I feel about it. Uh, let's talk about how to get an efficient paddle stroke. I think a lot of people paddle uh, in a way that's basically slicing through the water. Um, that, that is, they're putting a lot of effort into it, but not really getting much return. So that one kind of looks like this, right? You're forward, boom, dun, boom. And you see what's happening here is the blade hits, hits the water, and it's at an acute angle coming all the way back. And that small angle that way really reduces the amount of power you have in your stroke. And I think that's kind of an instinctual way to paddle. Uh, we think that we're pulling the blade through the water. Instead, try to think of a paddle stroke as a process of pushing down on the water. Pushing and then pulling, pulling through. So what, what do I mean by that? What you want to do is you want to reach forward as far as, far as you can and you essentially push down on the water as you pull it, pull it through. That opens up your blade, blade face on the water and you end up getting a whole lot more power that way. You know, that's why bent shaft paddles are bent at about 11 degrees because it allows uh, more of the blade to essentially push down on the water. That's a helpful way I use to think about it. So in order to really get that open blade face in front, front of you, you have to really throw your arms out, really reach, reach forward. And the way you do that is, as you can see, twisting with your torso. So instead of just reaching with your arms and your back and pulling back, you think engage your entire core. So you twist, twist forward and then twist back and that way you're not using so much of your arms or your shoulders, which get tired a lot more quickly. You're using your abs, your back. You're really using those big muscle groups so you'll get less fatigued. Um, so let's see how, how that works, right? So you're, so you're basically here, here, I'm say I'm you know, in my pretend bow seat, and I twist forward, twist so I can really reach that out there. And then, and then it's a matter of, boom, pushing down on the water, pulling through, and this is your power phase. This is where you're gonna get most of the oomph in your paddle stroke. The, the last half, past your hip, that's basically there for, you know, decoration, show, to allow the bow person to throw in their correctional stroke. So, I'm not going through a whole 
how to paddle better, better and what your stroke should look, for, look like. It's really kind of two key principles to keep in mind. One, keep it, think that you're pushing down on the water when your blade hits the water. And two, reach out, twisting your torso, engage, engage your core. That's gonna help you with the reach, that's gonna help you paddle longer and strong, stronger. And with those two things in mind, it can really help your paddle stroke. Um, but beyond that, I encourage you to ask people who uh, have paddled a lot. Ask people who are canoe marathon racers. Go to a class. Uh, it's constantly a work in progress for myself, trying to become a better paddler. Um, and it's really rewarding once you master um, these kind of basic, simple strokes. You'll be surprised how much further, how much longer you can go. Number two, you only need two knots about 95% of the time. Those are... The bowline, which is, of course, a, a simple anchoring knot that, that is often used to stake out your tent. And the second one is top line hitch. A top line hitch is basically a sturdy slip knot. So if you're setting up a clothesline and you have a bowline on one end to anchor it down and then a top line hitch on the other, that makes it really easy to adjust it and make it taut and it can be used in multiple other applications. Like I said, I use these two knots probably 99% of the time when I'm out there. Uh, granted, if you are carrying a canoe on top of your car or your truck, you're gonna need the trucker's hitch. Um, but when you're out in the field, bowline, top line hitch, those are the two that you'll need the most of all. Tip number three, packing your gear. Now, there's no shortage of controversy over what's the right way to pack a canoe, what's the right way to pack a pack, how many packs should you bring, etc. Uh, I'll leave you to uh, hash that out with your buddies over long winter nights when you're just eagerly anticipating that trip to the boundary waters. The packing advice I always give is pack in a way that ensures you have to make just one trip down a portage trail. Um, now granted, there are different styles of trips that include lots of food, lot of, lots of camp gear, maybe some really large tents where you'll just no, end up pet portaging twice no matter what. But for most trips, you should be able to get through with just one carry. And the main way to do that is for the person who takes the canoe to also take a pack. Now this can be slightly dangerous as you could be overloading someone, especially if you have an 80 pound drum in and then you throw a 50 pound pack on their on their back, you know, unless they're a linebacker, you know, this could be definitely a recipe for an ankle sprain. So to avoid injuries while still making this single trip portage, uh, I recommend taking a smallish pack, such as this kind that's made by uh, Frost River. Uh, it just swallows a whole lot of gear. Um, you can, there's still plenty of room in the main cavity. There's lots of places on the side where you can pack gear. And, you know, if it's fully loaded, maybe about 20 pounds, depending on what gear you put in there. Uh, and that, that can go on whoever is taking the canoes back. Uh, other, another packing secret to use is you take a larger pack, like this is a, I think this is an old Quetico style from Granite Gear. Been, been on lots of trips with me, as you can see. And you load it up with bulky, lightweight things. So put the sleeping bags in here, put the, put the, um, the sleeping pads, maybe some down jackets if you're going during the cold season. But make sure it doesn't get too heavy. Um, that way you, really, you uh, free up gear, free up space in the other packs that the other people are taking. Um, and you allow the person who's taking the canoe and the pack to have a relatively lightweight backpack on their back uh, while going down that portage trail. Um, so that's kind of the key ingredient to unlocking that magical, oh-so-good feeling of having to just make one trip down the portage trail. On the topic of packing, tip number four, get a thwart bag. Uh, this is a waterproof seal line bag. I have one of these on all my canoe trips and one of the main reasons I do is A, keeps everything I need during the day close at hand and in a waterproof container and B, it's a very noble goal when you're out in the boundary waters not to have to open up your packs 
and get things out while you're traveling during the day. This makes it more efficient, uh, does away with a lot of frustration of possibly digging through an unorganized pack, just looking for your bug net. So you carry a thwart bag. What do you put in the thwart bag? Well, I, for one, usually tend to put the lunch for the day in there. What other goodies might I have in there? Toilet paper, of course. The bug net, so it's not lost in the pack. Cliff bar for those moments where I just need a little pick-me-up. And of course, my copy of Fifty Shades of Grey because you need good reading when you're out in the boundary waters. Number five, rotate chores. Now, this is an important part of everyone getting along. You might be going on a trip with three, four other people, friends, family members. You might have one person who insists they're the best cook and that they want to cook dinner all the time. And that might seem like a good idea, but if you're out for maybe five days or a week, uh, it can cause some problems. Namely, the person stuck doing the dishes or the person stuck setting up the tents and taking down the tents might start to feel like they want to do a little more or feelings can arise within the crew that, hey, I'm doing most of the work. Now, if you rotate chores, one day the person who cooked one night is the next night the dishwasher and then who was the dishwasher then becomes the quartermaster responsible for setting up tents and making sure camp is tidy. That's a good way to ensure that everyone gets a little taste of camp life and no one feels like they ended up with the short end of the stick. No one feels like they did more work while other people were slacking off. And while we're on the, min on the topic of chores and cooking, number one thing that erupts, that causes fights to erupt in camp, telling the cook what to do and telling the cook how to cook. So good rule of thumb is let the cook be. They're gonna be, they're gonna be fine making your dinner. And you know, if it doesn't turn out right, Everything tastes about 10 times better when you're out in the Boundary Waters everywhere. Number six, planning. I'm sure a lot of you right now are planning your summer canoe trips to the Boundary Waters. And a real simple way to go about planning, which I think can make a lot of difference, both for crew dynamics and how everyone enjoys the trip, is to really be deliberate and set out with a certain intention for your trip. Um, now, I know that sounds like a bunch of new age wellness stuff right there to be intentional and deliberate in how you visualize your trip, uh, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is think about the goal or the, or the purpose. Do you want to fish a lot? Do you want to just relax and sleep as much as possible? Which, having been a new father in the last few years, I totally get. Uh, do you want to make do you want to make miles? Do you want to set speed records? You know, come up with something beforehand that will really determine the tempo and the pace and the expectations for the trip. This way it kind of gets everyone on board and I think does a whole lot to, uh, to, to, to help make a, a really satisfying trip uh, for everyone. Number seven, a lot of you are probably planning for your summer trips but my advice is go in the shoulder season. And the shoulder season is that in-between time. It's after ice out, but before the leaves are really pop. It's after all the leaves have fallen, but before the lakes have fro frozen in the fall. There's a lot of reasons to go during the shoulder season. One, you have the boundary waters almost to yourself, which is really special. Two, generally don't have to apply for, not apply, but you don't need to reserve a quota permit. Um, and three, it allows you to see a whole nother side to the boundary waters that you probably aren't gonna see during the summer or during the fall, which are the main times that people tend to go. Um, there's a link in the handout that's provided to a blog that's written by Bear Paulson from North Star Canoe, and he takes a yearly hiking trip into the Boundary Waters over Thanksgiving. Um, and that is shoulder season indeed. And I encourage uh, everyone out there to go try the shoulder season for themselves. This is a noon or noon tablet, N-U-U-N. 
And basically what it is, it's a flavored electrolytes. Uh, they have far less sugar than most mixed drinks. They provide the electrolytes to help you get hydrated. And, you know, I love water myself, but sometimes you want a little bit different flavor um, in the middle of a hot day. So pop one of these into your filtered water, get hydrated, tastes great. Next tip has to do with breakfast. Breakfast is a great opportunity to really cut down on weight and cut down on space. And the way you do that is by packing one of the most filling meals there are. This is about a half cup of 12 grain or 10 grain, I forget which. You can find them in the bulk area of most grocery stores. Um, it's hot cereal. You only need about half a cup, two thirds of a cup. Uh, and it fills you up and it sticks with you, you know, usually until lunch, depends on how hard you're working. But as you can see, you know, very compact, very affordable. I uh, throw a little sugar on it, throw a little, throw a little uh, dry, dried fruit, uh, and you're set to go. The other ingredient you can throw on that hot cereal is number 10 on my list of Boundary Waters tips, peanut butter. Doesn't matter if you're a smooth fan or a chunky fan, peanut butter is your friend in the Boundary Waters. Obviously not if you have a nut allergy, in which case I apologize for wasting your time um, and for what I'm about to do, which is going to really go into singing the praises of the magic of peanut butter. If you've never put peanut butter in with hot cereal, you are in for a treat. Oatmeal, 10 grain, multi meal, one scoop of peanut butter, magical. If you've never put peanut butter in with mac and cheese at the end of the day, you're welcome. Please send your thanks via donation to Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness for that tip. Um, and of course, if you got a cliff bar or any kind of bar that's a little too sweet, a little dull, throw a gob of peanut butter on it during the afternoon and it's going to make lunch all the more better. I always bring peanut butter. It's a staple on any trip for me and for many people. Speaking of food, number 11, don't be afraid of perishables. It is surprising how much perishable food you can bring with you on a week-long trip into the Boundary Waters. For instance, a lot of people bring steak for the first night. Obviously, you don't want to keep that steak around and have it the fourth night, or else you're going to have some real medical emergencies, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, but eat that the first night. You can bring in bagged salads with you and have a fresh salad the first or second night on trail. There's plenty of vegetables, such as potatoes, onions, peppers, um, that keep for multiple days outside of a refrigerator. You can bring vacuum sealed cheese that will last several days out there. So there are definitely some perishable foods that people often don't associate with Boundary Waters trips that are fair game to bring. Number 12, an easy one, but a lot of people don't do it, bandanas. Uh, they're great for just throwing around your neck, keep the sun off, keep the sun off your neck, to cool off, help you filter water. If you want to sleep in and the sun's out, which often is the case in the Boundary Waters during the summer, you just throw it over your eyes and you're back, and you're back to Snoozeville. Number 13, your paddle is also a cutting board for those fresh veggies and for flaying fish. Number 14, is an outfitter. Outfitters are an amazing resource who can point you in the direction of both great fishing holes, magical canoe routes, places you may have never thought to have gone, even though you've been to the Boundary Waters a dozen, two dozen times. Needless to say, if you're a beginner, an outfitter can really open a lot of doors, provide gear, canoes, etc., things you may not have to experience the Boundary Waters. But there are plenty of highly experienced people who use outfitters. Um, I have a friend up in Grand Marais who is a guide uh, and was telling me how last year he guided a woman and her son on a four-day trip and this woman had done 90-day dog sled expedition up in the Northwest Territories and you know I was kind of surprised and thought well why does she hire you it seems like she's probably a little has a little more experience than you have and he laughed he said she did but you know, she wanted free time around camp, wanted to go see someplace new. Um, so 
Whether you're experienced or a newbie, check out the Outfitters. They're a great, they're a great resource. 15 has to do with stoves and cooking. Um, I, the best advice I can get, give is to get one of these collapsible wood-burning stoves. They weigh less than half a pound and allow you to use a minimal amount of kindling and wood to cook your meals and to boil water. So they're both A, very lightweight, and B, takes care of the issue of having to gather firewood, which we all know during high peak season can definitely be a challenge around your camp. Number 16, for that folding stove that burns kindling, go to your dryer and pick out all, all the lint in the lint trap before you go. Put that in a little tin can. You got the best, cheapest fire starter money can buy. Try to find that advice in any other canoe book. Number 17, the little things. Little things make a big difference, especially if it's a rainy day, it's a particularly hard day, you want some little niceties to uh, you know, cheer you up, boost the morale when you get into camp. These can, of course, include Oreos or no-bake cheesecake for dessert, um, but also hard candies. Um, I don't eat hard candies back at home, but I always have a packet of Werther's Caramels with me, and I just am ravenous with them on trail. Uh, they're fantastic. Other ones, get into the tent at night, a little balm, such as this uh, lavender balm or tiger balm, put it right underneath your eyes just a little bit. Sounds weird, but again, it's amazing. Then gold balm, which of course is strictly for the feet. Don't forget that. Um, and any other small little nice things that you have at home that can become rituals in camp that really enhance the experience. Don't let gear get in your way. You know, over the last 20 or 30 years, the outdoor industry has really exploded and in ways has put up barriers to people getting into the wilderness uh, by creating this false image that you have to have a $400 Gore-Tex jacket, you have to have a bomb-proof tent that you need $35 wool socks if you want to go out there and be comfortable. You know, that's simply not the case. Uh, if you want if you want some really good deals, check out places like Goodwill, Savers, Salvation Army. Uh, they have, have nylon cotton blend clothing, which uh, can great, be great, great during the summer. Army surplus stores are just a treasure trove when it comes to inexpensive wool socks. Uh, and you, I guess the overall point is, you do not need to have a $90 Merino wool blend super wicking shirt in order to enjoy the boundary waters. 19, bring a pee bottle with you. Uh, that is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, a bottle that you pick up at a gas station, you know, get your final Gatorade before you go on, on trail and bring it with you into the boundary waters. Um, women want to bring an FUD, a female urination device, uh, and you're equipped with these when you go into the tent, then you're not going to have to step outside into the ferocious swarm of black flies or mosquitoes, or just have to go outside in general if you have to, if you are like me, a middle-aged person who frequently needs, wakes up needing to pee during the night. Final tip on that note, after you use your pee bottle, be sure to put it outside your tent in the vestibule. Tip number 20, clean camp, clean canoe. Now, this tip isn't so much about me being uptight and trying to make you, you know, tidy up your camp, tidy up your canoe and telling you it's going to lead to a better trip. Uh, a lot of this has to do with responsibility uh, towards the other campers and responsibility towards the wilderness. Why? So, a canoe that's strewn with sunscreen, sunglasses, clothes, that's just a mess, when it pulls up, it, when when that canoe gets to a portage trail, it's going to take a long time for all that stuff to get reconfigured into a pack and carried over. Um, that means you're more likely to have a bottleneck at the portage trail and slow other parties down rather than get through it quickly. It also means it's more likely that you're going to lose something. Same with having a messy camp. 
the likelihood that you're going to lose a toothbrush or a spoon or a cup just because you leave it strewn around uh, is just increased when you don't tidy things up. Um, not to mention, you know, things happen, unexpected things happen at night. Animals can come into your camp, wind can pick up, rain can happen, storms pass through, um, all sorts of things that can severely dampen the progress of your trip. So just, you know, put things away, put it underneath the vestibule, you got a canoe on shore, that's a great place to store things. You know, make sure everything is in its spot by the time you go to sleep. And when you're on the water, you know, put it back in your thwart bag, put it back inside of your pack. Uh, don't just leave things laying around. 21 might seem obvious, but a tarp. Bring a tarp, even in, even in the summer. It really brings the camp together. Obviously, you want to have a tarp because of rain, and Cook's Custom Sewing sells some great tarps for that. Cook's Custom Sewing also has some great tarps with um, bug walls on them. So if you're going with people who, you know, really hate mosquitoes or black flies, having one of these walled tarps in your camp is a miniature sanctuary uh, and can do a lot to increase the overall feel of the trip. So tarps bring things together. Now, again, tarp can be a nice place to uh, put a lot of your miscellaneous debris. Tip number 22. A sheet, not just any sheet though, a bag liner. This is an old sheet that um, has been sewn together on the sides and on the bottom to fit in the sleeping bag and create a bag liner. Obviously you can go out and spend 30 or 40 dollars on a similar one at an outdoor store. Whichever way you go, use one of these in your sleeping bag. It will make your sleeping bag last much longer greatly reduce the stench that inevitably accumulates in a sleeping bag. Um, and on those hot nights, it adds, it can work as kind of a cool sheet when you don't need a full sleeping bag over you, or during those cool nights, it gives you a little extra warmth. Tip number 23 is for people who have been to the Boundary Waters a few times. And my advice here is to challenge yourself a little bit. I'm not talking about, you know, go into the woods with only a hatchet and see if you can survive like your favorite adolescent novel. Um, rather, maybe consider building a fire in the rain. See, see if you can do that. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge that's really satisfying once you get those flames roaring and that water boiling. Uh, another cha challenge is to take a night paddle. Obviously there are some complications here. Uh, in the summer, it's probably not recommended that you travel at night because most campsites will be occupied. Um, but you can't. But on a full moon with clear skies, you know, go out for a night paddle for an hour or two and come back to camp. You want to be sure that you chart your course beforehand and stick with it, and always know where you are because obviously it's night, so it's a lot easier to get lost. Uh, another idea for a challenge is what's known as a voyager's morning. That's when you break camp in under an hour, but you don't just wake up, eat cold cereal, and go. You have to build a fire, have a hot breakfast, have a hot drink, and take down camp and be, and be out of camp within an hour. And there's a lot of logistics that go into this, and it's a real fun challenge of coordination, speed, um, that especially if you're bringing some young people with you on the Boundary Waters, uh, can really build confidence and be inspiring to see them you know, rise to meet these challenges. Number 24, and this one is just gonna be a quick smorgasbord of advice I think is valuable. So you get a few extra bonuses here. One, if you only bring one fabric into the Boundary Waters, make sure it's wool. Wool is the wonder fat, is the miracle fi fabric. I don't know how it does it, but it does keep you warm while, while it's wet. Um, it's insulating, it's breathable. Just wool is your friend. Um, other one, there's no such thing as ideal footwear. So quit sweating it. Bring, bring footwear that you're comfortable with and that's good enough. 
Um, especially in the summer, plan your days so you get to the campsite early. This also means you have plenty of time to fish, to relax, to read, to kind of engage in recreational activities. Uh, and finally, if you have a group that's larger than three, be sure to bring a gravity filter. Um, otherwise, you spend a lot of time with a steri pen, uh, sterilizing water, or exhaust yourself pumping, pumping the hand pump to get filtered water for everyone. Okay, so finally, number 25, I'm just going to end with the best advice anyone ever gave me. And this happened on my first canoe trip. It was in central Manitoba. I was 16. I didn't know anything about the wilderness. I loved to complain. I was scrawny. Um, I was not the stout woodsman you see before you today. Anyways, our crew had just gotten done with a very long portage, muddy. It was raining. It had been raining for the previous six days. The bugs were ferocious. We were sitting on this wet rock eating lunch. And of course, everyone was complaining about how bad the bugs were. And my guide said, guys, when else are you gonna be able, when else are you gonna be able to eat lunch in the rain with mosquitoes? And keep that in mind whenever something gets hard or when you just see something beautiful. When else are you gonna be able to do this? Where else are you gonna be able to do it? Uh, Boundary Waters is full of magic. Uh, and even at the hard times, we should be lucky that we're able to experience and enjoy a place like this. Okay, well, that's all from me. Thank you again very much for joining me today. I hope something I said here will add to your next Boundary Waters experience. Uh, if you have any questions, please e email me at pete at friends-bwca dot o-r-g uh, and uh, look forward to talking to you look forward to hearing about your own experiences um, and if you have other great tips that you think i should know about i'm all ears 